Today we have a very special shop tour for you. I'm joined by Jeff, who's the executive vice president of the Lee Company. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks so much for coming. Now, really happy to give to have people you. a little background on what the Lee Company does, if you had to put it in a sentence, how would you describe it? So we make miniature um, hydraulic components that control fluid flow inside hydraulic systems. Our prim primary markets are the aerospace industry. Uh, we also make stuff for light industrial automotive and for the medical industry. We have, we, uh, have approximately 1.2 million square feet of uh, manufacturing space and offices. Um, and how many people work here? We employ around 1,200 people. Um, I think I have about 500 machine tools, so I know you're excited to see that stuff. If you don't mind showing us, we'd love Absolutely. to take a look. So this is our engineering tool room for, for this particular group. Um, so we've got some model makers and tool makers here. They're doing stuff, they're making parts for the design engineers, be it a new product that we want to try out, or they're making tooling and fixturing that we use on the production floor for the manufacturing engineers that we have. So you're always going to see a couple of hard inch manual lathes, you're always going to see a couple bridge ports, and then in every group you'll see a few other you know, CNC type of machines or other things that we need to do to get parts done in that group. And now I do know, I see a Euro, Eurotech here. Yep. When it comes to making decisions for investing in machine tools, how do you guys typically, I mean obviously if you're a huge production facilities, how do you make that choice to go with a certain brand? So each one of my groups has their own personality because they are, you know, for me it's six groups, but they're 10 groups across the company. Uh, they have their own personality. Uh, they work with the tool machine vendors. Uh, honestly, it's a personality match, but it's also service and uh, quality of the equipment. Now I do see some machines here that you probably wouldn't expect in a super high tech aerospace place like this. I see a machine that looks like it could be from the 60s in there. So that is a more um, jig grinder. A jig grinder. We've had that machine for a long time and we're making very accurate uh, ID grinding with that particular machine. I can believe yeah. it. When it comes to that kind of stuff, if you have one that works, it's big, it's heavy, yeah. it's stable, it's you want fantastic. to hold on to it. I see five axis mills. I see, and this is just the tool room. That's what's crazy, guys. This isn't even actually the production. As Jeff mentioned, this is just to service their own fixtures, one-off models. It gets crazy once we get going. So this is our test lab for this particular group. It's not a very large test lab, uh, but as we're going into aerospace hydraulic systems, we really need to be able to simulate any hydraulic system that we're going in. So we're gonna have a, a range of different hydraulic uh, test stands that have a different kind of fluid in them so that we can simulate exactly where we're going. In this group, we don't 100% test everything because we're selling to a screen hole size, but in all of my other groups um, across the company, we 100% test everything. Average size hole is probably 100 micron, 4 thousandths, so 4 thousandths screen hole size, 100 And micron. some of these things that are this big will have 14,000 holes in them. Exactly. Try and Absolutely pack as crazy. many holes in as we can, get as much open area for the customer as we can so that the screen is fairly invisible to their system. Makes sense. Because they don't want to you know, sacrifice, give up some horsepower to take a pressure drop through a screen. They want it as, as invisible as possible to their system. This is our scanning electron microscope. As I said, we go down the screen hole size at 25 microns. So we really need to be able to inspect those holes. Uh, I know you've got some close up of this, but you'll take a look at what a 25 micron hole looks like compared to the head of a pin. Um, so there's a, a pin, there's a screen, there's a 25 micron hole size. So next we're headed out to our assembly area. So fairly small assembly area because a lot of our parts are one piece in this group, so we don't really need to do a lot of assembly. Um, but we're assembling some of our brazed or bonded screens in this area, so we're uh, sub-assembling parts to go through our furnaces. Um, we've got two hydrogen furnaces here, and we've got two uh, vacuum furnaces behind us. So, so those actually burn hydrogen in an atmosphere in order to treat your parts? They don't burn hydrogen, the atmosphere that the parts are um, exposed to is a hydrogen environment. Right. So it keeps the oxygen away. So, so you don't get any carburization. Right. So there's a nitrogen curtain on both sides of a small 
cube of hydrogen where the parts will be there that'll be at approximately 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Crazy, so, absolutely yeah. crazy. It's, yeah. uh, there's no physical door on that, it is strictly curtain. There's no, there are some blast doors just in case, but there, you know, the parts flow through, they All just day. flow right through on a belt and they go right through, right through the hot zone at 2,000 degrees. The other little thing I'd like to point out as we walk through here is just about everywhere we've gone so far, whether it is an actual inspection area, a production area, a tooling area, there are inspection stations, microscopes, um, I've seen CMMs pretty much everywhere in this facility. Yeah, so, so um, inspection is a part of our culture, really. So we ingrain it into everyone and we explain to everyone that everyone is an inspector. Our parts are in critical applications, uh, you know, especially in the aerospace industry. Uh, any one of our parts fail could mean the failure of a hydraulic system on an aircraft. Fortunately, aircraft does have a few hydraulic systems, so you still, you're still okay, don't worry about it. Uh, but we don't want to be the cause of any failure in the hydraulic not. system. So where are we walking into right now? I see some big DMGs, I see some malaise. I take it this is where the real production so happens. So we're, yeah, we're in primary machining now for this particular group. Uh, we've got a line of chuckers, we've got a line of Swiss machines, and then we've got a couple of VMCs that you notice that take up a good amount of real estate. Now I take it because you guys want as much production in this facility as possible, just about everything that can have automation and a bar feeder on it is going to have that. Yeah, so we do a lot of lights out manufacturing. So we've been doing it for a long time, but certainly the technology of a vision system sort of stuff starting maybe five years ago, and about the same time, automation with UR robots came along and really allowed us to step up our game on lights out manufacturing. Hard to find people these days, so we certainly are not eliminating people's jobs. We are trying to free people up so they can do other stuff that we need them to do. More important work. That's the most important thing. Uh, it does make us more efficient and that's fantastic. See everything set up for doing lights out for the most part. Um, you'll see some robots, you'll see some parts catchers, um, Again, we're seeing in-process inspection everywhere here. Yeah, we do only run one shift. So uh, daytime is hectic, if you will. That, that one shift that we do run is fairly hectic. The machines are running all night long. So when you come in in the morning, you've got you know, a whole night's worth of run of parts. So you've got to do some statistical process control and inspection on those parts when you come in. If you've reached the end of a run, because our run times are you know a week to two weeks, so with this many machines, you've always got machines that are coming to the end of their, their particular runtime. So you're gonna have to tear it down and set it up for the next job. So daytime is quite busy with everyone doing stuff. You can see a uh, robot arm over here and we're just doing some stuff during the day to get it ready to run again uh, overnight tonight. And just so people know, when we're talking a production run, are we talking five parts? Are we talking a hundred? Are we talking a thousand? What's kind of, I know that it varies, but what's kind of typical for a run here? Yeah, in this particular group, our runs are going to be around 250 pieces to 500 pieces. Um, that's kind of middle of the road. And some will um, be this big and some will be this yeah. big. Oh, yeah. Well, that's 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 pretty big. It's more like this big to that I don't big. know if I can get on camera how exactly. small that's supposed it's to be. It's pretty small. And what kind of seal, when we're looking around at these parts, obviously everything tends to be a stainless or derivative. What kind of materials are you guys running in these machines? Yeah, it's, for the most part, 300, 400 series stainless. We do do a, interestingly, we do do a lot of parts for the oil tool industry. So we got some stuff that you probably wouldn't like. Not at like all. Like Manels and Incanels, uh, Hasteloys, things like that, that we're, that we're making uh, screens for. The thought um, of making a screen out of Incanel yeah. makes my blood pressure rise as we right. speak. And uh, on this particular machine, we're setting up and we're running a 347 uh, material. So it is a 300 series, but it is high nickel content. Uh, so it is a little tougher to machine. So we're going through some growing pains and we're making a fairly big part. I know we looked at it so earlier. You know, the part that we're making is, is this side. So we're taking we're taking a solid chunk of bar and we're getting we're throwing away most of it. And chip it must left. be enormous to deal with. Yeah, particularly since we're running so much lights out, you're making a lot of chips. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> like I said earlier, we get a lot of big uh, you know, food containers from, uh, from Tractor Supply. 
uh, to cart our chips away. But chip management in the machine is very important, so all the coolant lines, how we're getting those chips out of the way, how we're getting them out of the machine is very important. It's a whole part of how we do our process development. You can't do lights out without good process development. The first thing you need to do is figure out, you know, how long can we make this machine run without anyone having to touch it? That's the optimal scenario. Exactly, because if we want to run 14 hours overnight, you want to make sure that you don't have to be changing tools or making offsets. There's some things that we can do. Um, to cheat on that, we can load extra tools in the machine so that, you know, it does half of the job with this tool and then it'll switch over and make half the job with this tool. We'll do some bumps, some offsets and stuff, some uh, tool management to make sure everything's still running good so we're not making any scrap overnight, but it does optimize our process. So chip management is a huge part of that process because if you're gonna run 14 hours with nobody watching it, we wanna make sure. These are some of the longest bar feeders I have ever seen. And since that is Swiss, I'm taking it you guys can get quite a few hours of runtime out of these. Yeah, so like, obviously, like I said, we're trying to run 14 hours, at least overnight, and even longer on a Saturday and Sunday sometimes. Uh, so we have multi-bar feeder. Uh, we do need to go to high RPM. These Swiss, these Swiss machines are smaller size, so we are making a lot of our smaller parts. And as you know, as we get the tool closer to the center of the bar, uh, we got to get our RPMs up. So, you know, we're up at 5,000 RPMs on the bar feeder, so we want a nice hydraulic bar feeder, and we want to be able to keep feeding bars in so that we can keep parts coming off the machine all day long. And interestingly, we get a little less drift at night because the sun's down, so we don't have that solar heating of things happening <laughs> during the day. You know, and then during the day, you see a little more drift because there's more people here, the temperatures, you know, temperature seems to vary a little bit more. And one thing um, I'd like to point day. out here, speaking of sun and daylight, I have never been in a machine shop or production facility that has this much natural light. Yeah, I think so- not, not, not by mistake. It's not by mistake. Uh, we are, you know, basically based on kind of Butler building style. Uh, but I always, I learned a long time ago that I love the clear story lights. So the least when you're working at a machine, you, you can tell what it's doing outside. Yeah. Like, is it daytime? Is it nighttime? Is it snowing? Is it raining? What's it doing? So the clear stories are nice. But beyond the clear stories, we've got some bump ups here. So we're getting natural light. We're facing to the north for these um, uh, natural light that's coming in on this side. On the south side are actually solar panels on the roof. So we're collecting up solar energy. And then throughout the building, we have uh, adaptive LED lighting. So the LED lights have a sensor in them. They're monitoring how much natural light's coming in. And we're adjusting the LED lights so that the light on the floor at your workspace is remaining consistent, whether it's sunny out or whether it's cloudy out. Not one of the smaller parts, but here's a little transfer tube coming off of this machine right here. So this will actually get a 25 micron hole uh, screen put on the inside of it. So the, this isn't the actual part, this is just a transfer tube. Right. The actual part's gonna go on the inside of here. Even smaller. Uh, so it'll be even smaller. Uh, but this is fairly big. Here's one of our more standard screens that we make. This is what we call a top hat. I know you can see why. And that actually it does not have any of the holes on it yet. So it doesn't have any process. holes. That's correct. We'll put the holes in next. Um, so we can use this as a blank because we're gonna make multiple hole sizes of this. So we can run the quantity up of this blank and then put the holes in of various sizes to make our different family of parts. And you know what frightens so, me? You describe that as one of your larger versions yeah, of that's, that part. Yeah, that's not too bad. That's a good size. So I know you saw these, they take up a lot of real estate, so you notice them right away. Our VMCs. Uh, so we're just, uh, this is actually a turn part that we have, but we need to make a flange here that's gonna have some bolt holes in it. So we're just- And what's crazy is you might think that that's a piece of screening that they have welded in there. That is one solid piece yep. from one blank. Yep. Tons of material removal involved. So it's super high strength screen. We usually quote uh, full system pressure. So you could clog that screen, bring it up to 3000 PSI and nothing would happen to it's it. It's not gonna grenade on it. Would, and typically you would have these running there just getting some maintenance done or whatever. We caught up. Right. It's a good thing. What a terrible problem to have. I know, <laughs> I know it's unusual, but we caught up in that particular case. All right, so we're, we've come into the inspection area. It's both our detail and final inspection area uh, where we're inspecting all the parts, both coming from the production floor and anything coming in from the outside. We have inspectors sitting at the benches doing their bench work, uh, but we also have some vision systems. 
uh, and we have some coordinate measuring machines which are doing an automated style of inspection. And just so to get a little clarification on something like this, when we're talking about doing an inspection, a full inspection of one part, is that a two minute, three minute, two hour, three hour? How long does it take to do one of those inspections? It's an hour's job, depending on depending on the part. But Makes sense. An hour. And you'll do, like you said, X number per lot, random sampling. Yep, exactly. It's, uh, it, I mentioned earlier, it's pretty crazy when you get to this level of production precision and manufacturing because even just the quality system involves math, sampling, statistics, stuff right. that in a smaller shop you probably have never dealt with. Right. It's a whole different way of thinking about yep. it. And I take it these inspections are a little bit more than just a inspection sheet. I take it you guys have a quite detailed management system for all this information. Yeah. We've got everything controlled the way we need to be controlled. We are AS9100 certified, so we've got everything the way we do. We need it. We've got everything calibrated. We've got, you see how nice and clean it is. We've got state of the art, everything that we need to get the job done. I always say, I always, respect and envy people who can have white floors in their shops yep. because of just the level of detail that requires it. Clean and bright. For miniature parts, we definitely need it clean and bright. So here we have a part on the Keon's vision system. So this is a vision inspection system. Um, so the, there's a camera in here that's taking a picture of the part and then based on that photo of the part it's going and uh, giving us the dimension of that particular feature. We can see how quick it is. It's capturing one end. Now it's capturing the other end and it's gonna give us all of our dimensions. So, a lot quicker than doing it at the bench, that's for it's sure. It's an extremely rapid inspection report. Jeff, thank you very much for your time today. If people wanna find out more about The Lee Company, where can they go? They can go to www.theleeco.com. And you guys I hear are always hiring, looking for good help, so if you're in the area, I have a feeling it should apply. Absolutely, that would be fantastic. We'd Thank you very much. More people. Thank you very much awesome. for having us. Thanks, Ian. Have a great day. Really appreciate it. So there you have it, guys. Thank you very much to the Lee Company for hosting us and everybody who participated. This is one of the nicest campuses I've ever been to in one of the nicest towns. And in fact, if you want to work for the Lee Company, especially if you are a skilled automation person or you are a skilled machinist, I do know they're always hiring. So make sure you check them out. Make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.